Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Committee on Health and Human Services, uh, Finance and Policy. Today's date is March 9th, 2022. Um, and for the record, we do have a quorum present. And uh, we are going to, we have two bills before us today. And the first one up is uh, Senate File 3257, brought to us by Senator Dreheim. Uh, Senator Dreheim, would you like to uh, tell us about your bill and get the our hearing started here? So, welcome. Thank you, uh, Chair. And actually, I think uh, we're going to plan to move this forward. So, if you want to uh, move your bill first, and then you can tell us about it. Uh, where's the next? Did it go to the floor? Yep, general orders. Okay. I, I would like to move Senate File 3257 um, to general orders. Okay. The bill is now before us, so go ahead and introduce your bill. Okay. Uh, members okay. and Chair, thank you for taking time to hear uh, Senate File 3257. Um, 3257 would provide uh, Children's Minnesota with an additional 22 beds uh, for their new inpatient mental health unit. We have talked over the previous weeks about the need for more access to mental health beds, um, especially for, for our youth in, in Minnesota. Um, several weeks, there are zero beds available for youth. And I think we all know people in our district or in our families that have tried to locate a bed for um, our, our uh, minors throughout Minnesota. So there, I think there's no debate about if there's a need or not. Um, I, I would argue we, we need more. We need more than uh, what is before us today. Um, This fall, Children's is opening a new inpatient pediatric mental health unit and is asking for a bed moratorium exemption for 22 additional behavior health focused beds. And uh, we, we had discussion in the past about the moratorium. As we debate that and as that process moves forward, I think this is a critical, critical bill that we need to act on uh, immediately. This bill would not have a fiscal impact on the state. So there, there is no fiscal note that I'm aware of that is needed for this bill. Um, they are going through the public interest review right now on, on this project. Um, and I believe it's strongly supported um, with various groups across the state. I have not had anybody approach me in opposition to to this bill, uh, but I could ramble all day. I'd rather t send it over to the testifier's chair. Okay. Thank you, Senator Draham. And the first uh, testifier I have on my list is Dr. Chawla. Welcome to our committee. Uh, please identify yourself for the record and then uh, proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair, committee members. Uh, my name is Dr. Gigi Chala, and I am the Chief of General Pediatrics at Children's Minnesota. Thank you uh, for having me here today, and thank you, Senator Dreheim, for carrying this important bill. Children's Minnesota is the largest pediatric health care system in the state, serving over 135,000 kids annually. Almost half of the kids we serve in our hospitals and clinics are enrolled in Medicaid. I am here today because one in five patients we care for have a mental health need. In 2021, we joined the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Children's Hospital Association, as well as the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry in declaring the pediatric mental health crisis a national emergency. This crisis has been exaggerated by the pandemic and will be around for years to come. But I wanna share two things about what we have been seeing in our emergency rooms at Children's Minnesota over the past few years. First, Kids come to our emergency departments after an overdose, suicide attempt, or other mental health concern for crisis care and medical stabilization. The volume of patients that we've been seeing um, has been increasing year over year for the past five years. But last year, we saw 30% more kids with mental health concerns compared to just the year earlier. 
suicidal ideation is now uh, in our top five diagnoses. And we're seeing disparities within this crisis. Last year, almost half of the patients that came to our ED with mental health concerns were from communities of color and indigenous communities. Secondly, the acuity of our mental health crises that um, kids are experiencing is also increasing. Out of the 2,000 patients that we saw present to our emergency rooms with mental health concerns, we had to transfer over 850 of them to other facilities for inpatient psychiatric treatment. That's a 40% increase in just two years. At Children's Minnesota, we have been working to address this pediatric mental health crisis in a comprehensive way. We have integrated behavioral health into our primary care settings, strengthened our outpatient mental health clinics, co-located mental health services within our specialty clinics, and opened an intensive outpatient day treatment program. Our goal has been to try to keep kids out of our emergency rooms, but this situation requires a more complete response. The next step needed in our comprehensive pediatric mental health approach is to open a 22-bed mental health unit. Um, and this will be um, performed by remodeling existing space in our St. Paul Hospital. This new unit, anticipated to open this fall, will include rooms large enough for a family member or caregiver to stay with the child receiving inpatient psychiatric treatment. This psychiatric unit will ensure kids with acute mental health needs and complex medical conditions who, because of their medical care, requirements sometimes have difficulty getting placement at other psychiatric units, will now also be able to receive high quality comprehensive care at Children's Minnesota. We are asking for 22 additional beds because this is a new program that has not originally been part of our long-term planning. We do currently have some beds that are temporarily not in use, which includes beds needed for surge capacity for volume um, illnesses, including for our ICU care, um, and many of these unused beds are also needed for expansions in key specialty programs, including cardiovascular programs, neurosurgery, cancer care for kids, and eating disorder services for kids. The growth of these specialty programs is in response to community, community need as well, and has been delayed due to the pandemic, but is now part of our board-approved strategic plan also. Without these 22 additional bed licensees, Children's Minnesota will have to open this new mental health unit at the expense of being able to either meet the volume needs for kids or community needs for these specialty programs. So our goal with this new unit is that Children's Minnesota will be able to increase access to desperately needed acute mental health care while bridging the current mental health disparities and improving mental health outcomes. Thank you for discussing this timely legislation, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, and doctor, you can stay right there if you like, because our next two testifiers are by Zoom, and then we'll get to questions and such. So um, next up, we have with us Natasha Chernyavsky, and uh, welcome to our committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Go ahead and identify yourself for the record, and please proceed. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, my name is Natasha Trinyavsky, and I'm the Legislative and Policy Specialist for Citizens Council for Health Freedom, or CCHF. Our organization exists to protect patient and doctor freedom, and I'm here today to speak in support of Senator Dreheim's bill, Senate File 3257. Although I'm only testifying in SF 3257, CCHF would like this testimony to be noted across today's entire discussion regarding Minnesota moratorium laws. From our perspective, this bill and others awaiting your consideration this year should be viewed as a call to end the entire moratorium process in Minnesota. SF 3257 seeks to add 22 licensed beds to Children's Minnesota, a St. Paul pediatric hospital. Senator Dreheim is not alone in his request. As you can see in the statute, over the years, starting with line 1.16, legislatures have added to Minnesota Statute 144.55 or 0.551, nearly 20 approved exceptions to the hospital moratorium. And Senator Dreheim's bill, like Senator Rosen's bill, which I believe is coming up next in this hearing, is another request for an exception. This year's requested exceptions to Minnesota's hospital moratoriums have had bipartisan support, 
underscoring the needs seen across the state for timely and increased access to health care. Repealing the entire moratorium process will allow current hospitals and potentially other entrepreneurs to compete to meet the growing needs of their communities without being hindered by the moratorium process and its time intensive bureaucratic demands. The time and effort it takes to go through the public review process hampers flexibility, imposes unnecessary costs, and takes time and money away from actual patient care. Eliminating the moratorium process and the burdens in public review will foster market competition, likely leading to quicker access to care and decreased costs in, health, in those health care services. According to the National Conference of State Legislatures, quote, as of 2021, 12 states have fully repealed their certificate of need programs or allow them to expire, unquote. The Cato Institute reports that 20 other states have suspended their certificate of need laws during the COVID pandemic when they realized the laws had left them, quote, unprepared for a sudden surge in the demand for critical care and other health services, unquote. Minnesota should join the dozen other states that no longer wreck barriers to quickly meeting unique and changing medical needs and patient care needs of communities. The COVID-19 pandemic proved that these restrictive laws can hinder the ability of facilities to make quick decisions that meet the needs of their patients. We ask that you take this opportunity to repeal altogether sections 144.55 to 144.554, including the public review. From our perspective, Children's Minnesota or an outside entrepreneur that um, can build better, faster, or more affordably should be able to add 22 beds or 30 beds or 50 beds as needed, and to do so without being hindered by state officials or state legislatures. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and next up, we have with us Kayla Albrecht, also joining us uh, online. Welcome, Ms. Albrecht. There we go. Please identify yourself and you can proceed with your presentation. Mr. Chair, Aki and committee members. My name is Kayla Albrecht and I am a registered nurse at Children's Minnesota, where I work in the St. Paul Pediatric Intensive Care Unit, or PICU. I am testifying in favor of the addition of the mental health beds, but want committee members to know about the changes Children's is planning that will impact the care given to the kids who will use these mental health beds. There is a pediatric mental health crisis and Children's is stepping up to ease the burden of this crisis. Children's is the perfect hospital system to do this because we are the kid experts. But there is more to the care of these children than just mental health inpatient services and I believe their care will be compromised with Children's current restructuring plans. Children's is planning to remove the PICU from the St. Paul campus, where many kids' lives have been saved after drug overdose suicide attempts. The St. Paul campus will have an emergency department, which will serve as a starting point for the mental health program. However, before starting this program, kids need to be medically clear. Often the kids that are nearly successful in their attempts require intensive life-saving support which can only be provided by a PICU and can include intubation or a breathing tube and hemodynamic support, like continuous blood pressure medications. I've been a part of these life-saving interventions and know how medically fragile these children can be. In our current model of care, these children are brought into the emergency department, quickly stabilized, and then are just an elevator ride away from the PICU with no delay in care. With children's proposed restructuring plans, the kids requiring intensive care will be stabilized in the St. Paul Emergency Department, then transferred via ambulance to the Minneapolis PICU, which historically can take hours to occur. Once medically cleared, these kids will then be transferred to St. Paul, where they will begin the mental health program. This will, be, this will create a tremendous burden on already stressed children and their families and is an unnecessary delay in care. Delays in care can have devastating consequences as these children can rapidly deteriorate at any point, including in an ambulance where there are less resources. I chose to start my nursing career at Children's because of their values, one of which is kids first. A pillar of this value is to speak up when the care being provided is just good enough, not exceptional. An emergency department and a mental health program that are not supported by a PICU under the same roof is just 
good enough care, and I believe children and their families deserve exceptional care. I am in favor of adding these mental health beds, but they need to be supported by a PICU that is within the same building as the mental health beds. I urge the committee to consider requiring the PICU to stay in St. Paul before granting these mental health beds. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Um, members, just a reminder, there's a, a number of letters and some additional information in our packets. Um, and with that, um, we will go to member questions, comments for either uh, Senator Dreheim or the testifier. Senator Abler. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And uh, to that last testifier, uh, Ms. Albrecht. Um, so I have not heard uh, that angle on this before, and so I just wanted to acknowledge that it's, it seems like it's a it's an interesting point, and I mean, healthcare systems have changed so much, and I just feel like we're always trying to keep up and watch what goes on, uh, consolidations, and 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 all that. But I, I don't have an amendment, but it, and so maybe uh, the representative children's could talk about about that. But I, I wanted to at least just say that I heard what she said. It seems reasonable on its face. The economics of healthcare have been. You know, Children's has had a stellar reputation in the past for chasing uh, quality and family care over their profits, and so I admired them for that. So maybe they, could they just comment just a little bit? Not to, it's, it's not on the topic really, but it's just related. So is that okay, Mr. Chair? Sure, thank you. Um, Dr. Chalau, do you want to tackle that one? I sure can. Thank you, okay. uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Abler, and uh, committee members. Um, and, and thank you to, to Kayla for um, bringing this important topic up. Um, certainly, I, I just want to also offer some perspective. Um, these are completely separate issues, the, um, the beds and the location of where we are building. The inpatient mental health unit is not in, in any way related to where the beds are for the pediatric ICU. Um, we have a separate process which uh, we intend to follow in which um, we'll, we'll bring forward um, this proposal for uh, movement of our PICU. I don't think this will occur before 2023, but we'll adhere to the st statutorily required public hearing around this redesign. Um, so uh, specifically for the issue on clinical care that uh, Kayla brought forward, um, every child is important to us. Um, and uh, last year, 4% of kids who came into our um, emergency rooms um, in mental health crisis needed an ICU bed, only 4%. And so of that 4%, 20 went to the Minneapolis ICU and 20 went to the St. Paul ICU. I just want to keep um, some perspective on numbers. You know, we intend to serve more than 1,000 kids each year in our mental health unit. Um, we will transfer kids and get them to the level of care that they need for every situation, regardless if it's for ICU care, um, oncology care, cardiovascular care, or mental health care. Thank you. Further questions? Uh, Senator Abler, did that, you're good, okay. Senator Wickland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just curious, in your response, are you saying that um, the process to provide notification, which will then trigger the um, need for a public hearing, has that process been initiated? I guess if you could clarify where the process is in progress for that particular decision making. Doctor. Um, Mr. Chair, um, committee members, I may have to ask um, our children's director of public policy to be able to answer that question directly, if that's okay. I think uh, you've got a... Amanda Jensen, is that yes. correct? Okay, that me. welcome to our committee. Thank you, uh, uh, Senator Aki and members. My name is Amanda Jansen. I'm the Director of Public Policy at Children's. Um, and Senator if I could Wayne get you to kind oh, of yeah, uh, make absolutely. friends with that microphone, then we'll pick you up better. It's been a while since I've been in person at this table, <laughs> <laughs> Chair. 
Um, Senator Wicklin, so the requirement on that is that we would have to notify, kind of start that process at least 120 days before that move was going to happen. Mm -hmm. So that official notification hasn't been sent to the Department of Health just yet, so the process hasn't officially started. But we have been talking with them and working with them to understand what pieces of our redesign are subject to that public hearing process um, and kind of working with them behind the scenes before we actually hit officially go with them on starting that clock at that 120 days. Okay. Senator Wicklin? Yeah, and it, so it sounds like that, that will be done in that matter. Um, can you tell me anything about some of the analysis that will go into your process? Will it analyze um, some of the issues that, that um, uh, let's see, Kayla uh, brought forward in terms of the the time it takes to transfer patients, the, you know, it, I understand that you're saying uh, that there's a very small number that this would affect, but can you comment on the process? Do you analyze things like um, transfer times and waiting times and how that might impact patients who are in this, this condition that they need ICU access? Ms. Jansen? Yeah, Chair Aki and Senator Wicklin. Um, all of those, I'm, and I'm looking at Gigi here, I'm assuming that all of those conversations were absolutely a part of children's decision making when we first put these redesign plans forward. I'll share that it, I think those pieces will absolutely be part of information that we share during that public hearing process. It is also something as we've been working with MDH on the public interest review process, one of their follow-up questions to us just this week was asking us to further define any interaction at all between what uh, Kayla was talking about, between the PICU consolidation and these mental health beds. So our PIR application on this will also include some of that information as well. Senator Wicklin, anything I guess further? That, that just raises one other okay. comment I'd like to make about the PIR process that I wish we were at a point where we were able to analyze or access the information that will come about because of that. Um, you know, we're going to be asked to make a decision about this today, and we don't have this information in front of us. Um, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of clear support for this proposal, and um, what I read tells me that it is very needed, and it looks like it's very grounded in a lot of um, research about what, what the kids' needs are and where we could add this capacity. Um, but I do have, I want to share a concern that we aren't able to see the analysis that the Department of Health is going to do about some of these interactions before we make a decision. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, Senator Curran. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And this is for uh, Ms. Chihuahua. So um, how many beds are in existence today for the uh, adolescent mental health? And I know we're going to add 22. Um, in addition to that, how does that change the ability? Because I think you described the crisis that we have today, and most of those are kind of that emergent crisis, right? Real-time emergent crisis, uh, attempted suicide th threats, you know, attempted and or threatened um, erratic behavior, all those things. So I've experienced that as a parent. And so what, I have two kids that were drug and alcohol addicted, and so what changes in your ability or how does it enhance uh, in the proactive side outside of the crisis? And I really go into the, I'm a big fan, anybody who's heard me, I think we need a facility that's locked um, that a parent has access to prior to the engagement of a criminal activity which either leads to prison or death and or an attempted or threatened suicide. That's real and it happens every day. A parent today is in a powerless environment. They have no power, no tools. And so, and it all starts in adolescent years and then escalates. You hope they live through the bad mistakes, but sometimes they don't. So how does that change that scenario? Because I think that's a pretty prevalent scenario for what you see every day. But there's a whole host of families sitting on the outside that are in this crisis mode that never make it to your facility. And so how does it help any of that preventative side? So I'd love to, I'd love to get your comments. I know it's a long question, but either, in, and later is a follow-up as well, because to me, it's a major issue, so thank you. Doctor? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Cran, thank you so much for the question. Um, first of all, uh, I think the first part of your question is how many current beds do we have that we um, uh, serve psychiatric patients in the hospital? And the answer is zero. 
100% of our patients who need inpatient psychiatric treatment um, are held um, oftentimes for days until we are able to transfer them to an open psychiatric bed um, elsewhere in the community. Um, the second part of your question, I'm so sorry for the experience that your own family has had. Um, and I, I think what it really goes to is the fractured care that exists out there currently that families are experiencing. Um, and our hope with this inpatient unit is that we can begin to connect the dots, not only with services from inpatient to outpatient, but also even more upstream for preventative care. Senator Curran, any further? Yeah, thank, thank you. And, and so I'd, I'd love to, to have the further follow-up in, in as we go into this process or, or as you look at that care. Um, we do a lot of things, and, and a lot of it's around drug, really, drug use, you know, cause and or effect. Um, but how do, we get, how, how do we get apparent access to that resource before it's crisis? Because right now it sounds like, you know, I mean, you're just in the crisis mode. That's, that's your pure operating mode by, by default. But how do we get in the front side of it? And we do Rule 25s. We go through assessment evaluations. As a parent, I can't have a conversation until they're a couple days, three days, five days sober. So if you don't have a locked facility, besides hoping they commit a crime, that you can get them locked up and safe and secure to have that assessment or analysis. Nothing exists in the real world today to be able to help facilitate that. So um, we would have a bigger champion if we could get to that part or as a part of this transition or expansion, continue to work on the root cause. So thank you. Thank you. Um, Senator Klein. Thank you, Chair and Senator Dre Hyman. Thank you for your work this session to try to expand access to mental health. Appreciate the work of uh, Children's Hospital in this regard. Uh, very impressed by the letter of support from the National Alliance for Mental Health, and I'm proud to be a co-author with you on this bill. Uh, having said all of that, I, I, if the committee could just hear some explanation as to why uh, we don't have a public interest review report available to us today in this decision making. There is a timeline for these things. We all know what the timeline is, and it, it would have been possible, it seems to me, to have the report available. Is, um, Ms. Jansen, do you want to tackle that? Yeah, Chair Key, Senator Klein, thank you for that question. So. Your, the, the timeline for the PIR process is typically applications would come in in August. Our application, you're right, didn't go in until February 1st of 2022. Um, that was because we were responding to a crisis. So as uh, Dr. Chala mentioned, this mental health unit wasn't a part of our initial expansion plans. It wasn't a part of our initial strategic plan that our board was considering. It was very much in response to what we were seeing in real time. The data last year of 850 kids needing these type of beds that we had to transfer outside. So the, the timing in our uh, tardy application, if you will, is simply because we were trying to respond in real time to a crisis. Senator Klein? Any Good. All righty. Thank you. Members, any further comments? Senator Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to um, echo my support for these, uh, res these inpatient beds for our kids. It's so, uh, I, it seems that the mental health crisis that we were experiencing before the pandemic, um, our kids are gonna be experiencing that much longer than the pandemic and the, Early diagnosis and early treatment is so important for everything, uh, but particularly when you think about kids and mental health. And so while I understand the concerns that this, there's, the problem is so large, there's not just one solution. This isn't everything, but it is something. It is a tool, it is one more option for parents, for kids who have significant psychiatric mental health needs. These beds are needed, and I will be in strong support. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Um, Senator Dreheim, back to you for uh, your final comments, and then you can move the bill. Thank you, uh, Chair Aki, and thank you, members and, and co-authors. I was going to wrap up with that. Senator Klein, thank you, and Senator Coran, um, and Senator Pappas, our, our co-authors on this bill. Um, you know, I, I think we all realize the need, and, and I, I thank Children's for coming forward. I'm sure it is um, not uh, easy 
to put this plan together, uh, both fiscally <laughs> and all the red tape um, that goes along with, with this process. Um, but I do appreciate their efforts and it, it is in such demand. Um, you know, I know members on this committee have been affected. Senator Cran talked about it. Um, we have to get this done. We need more resources out there, and, and uh, you know, I, I hope we can move this today onto the floor and vote on it soon, uh, a week or two, and uh, and uh, try to help. So, thank you for your time, and I would like to renew my motion for Senate File 3257 to be passed and sent to general orders. Thank you, Senator Graham. Everybody understands the motion before us. So all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Thank you, Senator Graham. And testifiers who joined us here today. So thank you. Next up, we have uh, Senate File 3248 being brought before us by Senator Rosen. Welcome. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon, members. First time before your committee. I appreciate this hearing. Um, we have Senate File 3248 for you, and I know that uh, we've been talking about uh, hospital moratoriums. You had a uh, informational hearing about that, and this would authorize an exemption to that moratorium. Just briefly, in 1984, Minnesota Statutes 144.551 prohibit the establishment of the new hospital license and the expansion of existing hospital license beds. So I was really glad to hear some of the testimony in Senator Dreheim's bill talking about why do we even have this hospital moratorium? Because at the time, MDH said uh, they were concerned about overcapacity in hospital license beds and the cost associated with potentially excessive inpatient capacity. Well, now we are in a crisis, and Senator Draham addressed that, and you address that on a daily basis, a mental health crisis in the state and in this nation. And we have Senate File 3248 before you, Mr. Chair and members, that would provide an exemption to the current hospital moratorium law to allow Fairview, in partnership with Acadia Healthcare, to build a new 144-bed adult and geriatric mental health an addiction hospital at the former site of Bethesda Hospital, right behind us. And as we all know, and we continue to talk about it, and we need to do something about this, and as uh, Senator Nelson said, this is a t many tools in the toolbox. We have an acute shortage of mental health and addiction hospital beds in the state. And how can you ever put a cost on that mental health crisis? So with that, I think I would like to um, just get to our testifiers. Uh, I have Beth Hines from the Fairview Health, Ser uh, Health Services and Dr. Jeffrey Woods from Acadia Healthcare with me today to provide some additional information. And also Dr. Richard Levine, an emergency medicine psychiatric psychiatrist with Fairview who can help answer any questions that you have. All right, thank you, Senator Rosen. Um, we will go to, uh, I've got you down to starting off. Uh, Ms. Hines, is that correct? Okay, um, welcome to our committee, and uh, you can proceed with your testimony. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. Good afternoon. My name is Beth Hines, and I'm the service line executive for Fairview Mental Health uh, Addiction and, uh, Services, and I'm actually a clinical therapist by background. So I'm also joined today by uh, my colleague, Dr. Rich Levine. He's an emergency medicine psychiatrist and an outpatient medical director for Fairview. And he is actively involved in the care of our patients, navigating this mental health crisis and hospitalization. I thank you today for the opportunity to speak about our plans to build a new inpatient mental health and addiction hospital in partnership with Acadia Healthcare. I'm proud to say that Fairview is the largest provider of mental health addiction services in the state. In fact, historically, we've operated more than 40% of the state's inpatient psychiatric beds. Our commitment to this care and these patients is unwavering. 
We are constantly taking steps to make the continuum of care stronger, more sustainable, and more prepared to deliver high quality care to our community long into the future. But alone, inpatient mental health care in particular is increasingly difficult to sustain for health systems like ours. In 2019, we began seeking a partner to help us expand and enhance our ability to do so. And during an exhaustive search, we found that a new facility purpose built from the ground up in partnership with a leading provider in the field was the best possible solution for our community, our patients, and our organization. This new hospital will be built to operate 144 beds for adult and geriatric patients in a specialized state-of-the-art facility designed specifically for the needs of psychiatric patients and for the healthcare professionals who care for them. This hospital will serve patients not only from St. Paul and the East Metro, but across the state both from inside and outside the Fairview system without regard to patient's income or insurance status. Most importantly, this new hospital is an example of innovation required to meet this urgent community health crisis. This work and our partnership with Acadia is transformational step towards meeting an urgent and longstanding need for additional psychiatric hospital beds in our community. We appreciate that this hospital represents a new way of meeting inpatient mental health needs in our state. Instead of treating mental health in a medical setting, we are building a mental health setting capable of meeting patients' mental health and physical health needs. Operating this new hospital as a standalone facility will not create any new barriers for care for patients who need inpatient services. Further, no patient will be denied access to care at this new hospital because of their insurance status or their ability to pay. Patients will continue to access inpatient care in our system at the new hospital through any of our 11 emergency departments around the state. And as we do today, we will continue to work with our peer health care systems and EDs around the state to admit patients who need hospitalization no matter where they initially seek care. The new hospital will operate in close alignment with our system's mental health and addiction service line. Fairview physicians will be the attending physicians to our patients. Staff at the new hospital will collaborate closely with care teams across the Fairview system, from our emergency departments, our empath units, to our outpatient programs, and our integrated mental health and primary care teams, which have been in existence for 10 years. Together, patients will receive the highest quality care possible in a space that's actually designed for them and with the support of a system that can assist them through hospitalization, hospitalization to the next step or level of care, whatever they may need. Our search for a partner in this new facility coincided with plans to relocate acute care hospital services from St. Joe's Hospital in St. Paul to our other sites in our system. St. Joseph's is an aging facility in need of significant investments and improvements to continue operating as an acute care hospital. Doing so was simply not an option for our system, and it was not in the best interest of our patients. Instead, we committed to transforming the St. Joseph's campus into a hub of health and wellness services focused on prevention and addressing the social determinants of health in the community. This work began in 2020, and today the final remaining services at St. Joseph's Hospital are approximately 40 inpatient psychiatric beds. This summer, final hospital care will wind down and the Fairview Community Health and Wellness Hub will open its doors. In preparation, we are building up other mental health services across our continuum care while we work to bring the new 144 bed hospital online. Specifically, we are working to staff an additional 20 to 30 inpatient mental health beds at the University of Minnesota Medical Center, which will remain until the new facility is complete. We also plan to open our, si our system's second empath unit before the end of this year. In summary, we're eager to bring this new hospital online and confident in the positive impact that it will have on our community for years to come. This new hospital represents an opportunity to meet an urgent need while evolving and keeping patients' needs at the forefront. And I'm pleased to be joined by Jeff, Jeffrey Woods from Acadia Healthcare today. Jeffrey will share a few words on Acadia's deep expertise and commitment to mental health and addiction as a leader in the space. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Mr. Woods, 
and uh, you've already been keyed up the way it sounds. <laughs> Please introduce yourself for the record and you can proceed. Thank you, Beth, and thank you, Mr. Chairman and hey. members of the committee for the opportunity to speak and with you today. I'll remind you to Microphone. get close and personal with that mic we and then go. we'll pick you up real well. All right. Um, Again, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, members of the committee. My name is Dr. Jeffrey Woods, and the, I am the Operations Group President for Acadia Healthcare. I'm also a clinician with a doctorate in nursing practice and boarded in psychiatry. Um, it is my privilege to work with the health system like Fairview to help grow access to important mental health and addiction services at a time when they are needed more than ever. Acadia Healthcare is a leading provider of mental health services across the United States with more than 238 hospitals and treatment centers across 40 states and Puerto Rico. We treat over 70,000 patients each and every day in our, in our continuum of care and have treated more than several million patients over the last 17 years of our uh, company's operations. In addition to our wholly owned facilities, we often partner with local health care providers and hospital systems across the country to operate psychiatric hospitals and treatment centers that deliver specialized mental health and addiction services that uphold the highest standards of our profession. We are dedicated to providing evidence-based care with a proven commitment to quality and safety. We are thrilled to partner with Fairview in building and operating a new mental health hospital in St. Paul and we are ready, ready to deliver the same quality and compassionate care you came to know and expect from Fairview. Acadia's strength is our specialization. Our focus on mental health and addiction care has led us to become the, among the best of what we do. We can care for patients with incomparable compassion, quality, and efficiency. Further, we believe patients navigating mental illness and addiction, especially those who require hospitalization, can benefit from care in an environment designed specifically for their needs. The new state-of-the-art facility will be purpose-built from the ground up to deliver the highest quality specialty health care possible. The new hospital's design will promote patient dignity, open sight lines, wide hallways, elevated ceilings, abundant natural light, and open, flexible meeting spaces will support patients and their comfort. Specially designed furnishings and fixtures will support patient safety in acute hospital environments while also providing a home-like setting and avoid, avoiding an institutional uh, experience. Our model is fully integrated and designed to care for patients' whole health, mind, body, and spirit, which includes chaplaincy services and other religious support services for our patients. We know that people in need of acute psychiatric care also require and deserve integrated medical care. Patients at the new hospital will, will be cared for by psychiatrists and certified nurse practitioners trained to manage many medical conditions and the day-to-day -day health needs common in mental health units. The hospital will also be staffed by internal medicine doctors, primary care teams, and other physician specialists ready to care for patients' physical health as the, as the other specialists help patients manage their mental health. Among other things, we are able to care for patients who may be intoxicated, overdosed, have suffered wounds from self-harm, experienced frostbite, heat stroke, dehydration, and a myriad of other medical conditions. These conditions can be common in people experiencing an acute psychiatric ep episode and unable to engage in regular self-care. This hospital will be fully integrated and ready for all of them, including diabetes, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, diseases of the heart, liver, and kidneys. And as a specialized hospital, we can provide integrated medical care for these chronic conditions, but do so in an environment designed to support mental health and substance use disorder healing at the same time. And of course, through close integration with Fairview's broader health system, patients will have ac access to the expansive network of specialists and professionals they need when they need them. Most importantly, the new hospital will create more access to this kind of care for more patients in Minnesota at any given time. Our new hospital will not will not operate an emergency department in the typical model of a medical surgical hospital. Instead, we integrate fully with our partners' emergency departments and other referral sources to quickly admit patients to the right care setting in our hospitals through a 24-7, 365-day intake process. Fairview's expansive network of emergency departments across the state will remain an important access point for patients in need of acute inpatient mental health care. We also know Fairview has an effective, integrated process in place to collaborate with other area hospitals and referring programs. This new hospital will enhance that process, not change it, by creating more beds at any given time. 
We are confident in the, in the positive impact our partnership with Fairview will have on Minnesota's system of mental health care and the patients who need specialized inpatient mental health and addiction care. Thank you again for the opportunity to share more about this work with you, and we look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Dr. Woods. Um, and Ms. Hines, you had mentioned uh, Dr. Levine, but he's just here for the question and answer part, right? Correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, so next up we have Sue, Sue Abra Abderholden, and she's gonna join us via Zoom. Welcome, Ms. Abderholden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members. Uh, Sue Abderholden, Executive Director of NAMI Minnesota. Um, so you've heard me talk before um, about our concerns about having a freestanding psychiatric hospital. Um, I heard today at least uh, some uh, trying to address some of the issues that we have raised before about um, people coming in with other types of healthcare conditions and wanting to make sure that they're taken care of. Um, but I'm gonna say we're still kind of nervous about this. Um, we haven't had really freestanding hospitals here other than a children's um, hospital uh, for psychiatric care. And I think if they had to do it all over again, they would change as well. Um, we are concerned about what happens when people are in an emergency room in some other hospital system and whether they'll be able to get in. Um, I do wanna say that you know we have this banked beds issue and Fairview has over 900 banked beds um, that are unused hospital licenses um, that my understanding is they wouldn't even have to go through a review process if they were putting a building on a current campus. Um, they have other campuses um, where they could actually put a building. Um, Regents has done that. They actually did that with the Masonic Children's uh, Hospital, put it right there on the Fairview Riverside campus. Although I will note that it did not include the Children's Mental Health Unit. Um, and that was renovated afterwards after the donors saw the condition that it was in. Um, there's a Woodbury campus, Fairview Ridges, South Dales, St. John's. Um, so there are places where you could put a beautiful new building um, that would still be integrated with all the other healthcare that is being provided there. Um, I will say that, um, you know, on the one hand, I'm glad that they're recognizing the crisis, but they did close down their psychiatric beds at South Jail. St. Joe's had over 100 people being served there, and now it's a whole lot less. Um, I'm, you know, baffled by the letters that we got when we objected to St. Joe's being closed, um, that it was because they were losing 45 million a year and it would cost 35 million in infrastructure upgrades. And now of course the upgrades is between 57 and 65. Most of the hospitals um, in Minnesota are able to continue to provide psychiatric services because their losses, if you will, are covered by providing other types of healthcare services. So we are concerned about the funding model, that the payer mix will change, and that other hospitals will be taking people who have much more serious mental illnesses. Again, because they don't have an emergency room there, they can decide who comes in. So I'm not gonna belabor the point, um, but I, again, I take the calls, sometimes daily, from people who are looking for care. And they are really tough calls, because we know there are waiting lists basically for everything. Um, but I want to make sure that we're building a mental health system that really takes care of the whole person. And more and more these days, what we're hearing is the need for integrated care, whether it's within our outpatient clinics um, and certainly within our hospitals. So I thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And uh, next up I've got on the uh, list here is Daniel Clute, and also joining us by uh, online here. So welcome to our committee. Great. Uh, Mr. Chair and committee members, uh, my name is Daniel Klute and I'm a registered nurse. Thank you for allowing me to testify today in regards to M Health Fairview's plan to bulldoze Bethesda Hospital and build a standalone mental health facility in its place. I worked at Bethesda for about 10 years before its closure. This proposed facility is intended to replace the mental health units currently at St. Joe's which is the hospital that I work at now. I've dedicated my career to patient care and more recently mental health care. My colleagues and I have watched in disbelief as inpatient mental health units in the Metro are shuttered despite a growing need for inpatient beds. For the fourth time in two years, our nurses are transitioning to new jobs due to restructuring from M Health Fairview. And the nurses are not happy about it to say the least not just because it has put them at a disadvantage in their careers, but because they truly care about the communities they serve. 
Closing St. Joe's before this new hospital is built will create a multi-year gap in care, negatively affecting uh, access to mental health services in the community and across the state. This bill is not just an exemption to the moratorium, it's really an exemption to the exemption process, considering MDH hasn't had enough time to complete a public interest review in order to provide the House and Senate committees what they need to make an informed decision. I understand the legislature is able to take action regardless, and that's why I'm here to help you understand from a nurse's perspective what's being proposed. And before I speak specifically to the proposal, I must say that these calls to remove the moratorium process altogether are frankly irresponsible. And we saw a similar effort in the House committee hearing, and I don't believe that it's in the best interest of patients to remove these basic guardrails. Um, so to the proposal, and Health Fairview's request for a public interest review, um, and as well as their response to MDH questions are concerning to me. I see them moving from using psych associates to mental health technicians. Uh, PAs have an educational background in psychology, wh whereas mental health technicians require less qualifications. The small number of nurses listed in their request is an indication that the patient to nurse ratios may be unsafe. The list of employees provided doesn't include security officers, psychologists, counselors, hospitalists, or MDs. Security officers in particular are vital in a facility like this. In 2020, healthcare workers at an Acadia facility went on strike for about four months over the complete lack of security officers. Mental health nursing is by far one of the most dangerous jobs and a well-staffed and collaborative team of security officers plays a vital role in this environment. Um, lastly, there is not going to be an in-house pharmacy, lab, or radiology services. We see some light description about the intake process, um, but not about the process to send patients out. And this is one of the most critical aspects of having a standalone mental health facility. We're talking about geriatric patients with neurodegenerative disorders and co-occurring psychiatric conditions. This patient population has a strong need for medical services. So too are patients who are detoxing and going through withdrawal. Not to mention the normal array of patient falls, medication reactions, stroke, and cardiac events. Without a lab or radiology on site to assess these things in a timely manner, staff will be left with a lot of risky judgment calls. Uh, providers and nurses are reluctant to work in these types of environments because they worry about risking their license uh, in these situations, which can also result in harm to a patient. Overall, this leaves me wondering, what are the innovative parts of the proposal? Does it really benefit patients? M Health Fairview often reports that they run a deficit when they provide mental health care services, and it causes the company financial hardship, despite their uh, various uh, avenues of revenue. So what will a publicly traded company like Acadia bring to the table when Minnesota really values a nonprofit health system model? And how are we going to ensure that the challenges Acadia has had in other states do not also cloud the services that they provide in Minnesota? So I appreciate the opportunity to voice my concern and thank you for your time. Thank you. And uh, the final testifier that I have on my list is uh, Laura Sales. I think she'll pop up and there she is, so welcome. Good afternoon, Chair Utke and committee members. My name is Laura Sales, and I am a lobbyist for the Minnesota Nurses Association. We represent about 22,000 nurses across the state, which are 80% of all bedside hospital nurses in Minnesota. Nurses know more than anyone the dire need for mental health services in Minnesota, including more mental health beds. Therefore, our concern with this bill today isn't about the goal to provide additional services and beds. It's about who will provide them and the track record of the company M Health Fairview has chosen to partner with to operate its new facility. Recently, Fairview disclosed that they have entered into a joint venture agreement with the for-profit for -profit company Acadia Healthcare and that they intend to cede employment and operational control to Acadia. Upon researching Acadia, we became alarmed and here's a few reasons why. In 2019, an Acadia Youth Treatment Center in New Mexico was shut down after abuse against allegations, multiple lawsuits, and losing its certification from state regulators. Also in 2019, the United States Attorney's Office, Southern District of West Virginia, announced a $17 million Medicaid fraud settlement with Acadia Healthcare in West Virginia. 
And they've paid over $26 million in penalties since the year 2000 for offenses against the False Claims Act, violations of wage and hour, workplace safety and health, and labor relations laws. Acadia has described the investment environment for behavioral facilities in the U.S. as a large market with attractive trends. We feel that is the wrong focus when we're talking about services for patients with mental health needs. A few years ago, M Health Fairview opposed additional mental health beds at Regions while shutting down mental health services at St. Joe's. And now they want to bring in a for-profit company to run a mental health facility. We need a full vetting of this partnership that includes answers to lingering questions before granting M Health Fairview the green light for this project. We desperately need mental health beds, but we have a responsibility to make sure those beds are safe and focused on the patient. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, Senator Rosen, would you like to respond to some of these comments made or your uh, testifiers that are with you at the tables to, uh, to answer those first and then we'll go to uh, member comments and questions? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I appreciate that. And I, I do think I am um, going to, to turn to Dr. Woods to address this last um, comments from MMA &M and then uh, perhaps I can address some other ones too, but um, okay. those need to be reviewed. Right. We need to address them and then we can move on from there. But uh, Dr. Woods. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, in addressing the comments made by Ms. Um, Sales, Acadia Healthcare, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, operates over 238 healthcare facilities across the country. In our entire 17 years of operations, we have not had one single facility that has lost its state license. We have not had one single facility that has lost or been denied the renewal of its national accreditation by the Joint Commission and other accrediting bodies. Um, we have not been denied access to or removed from any payer program, including Medicare and Medicaid in any state. Um, and all of our hospitals are operating in compliance with all of the CMS conditions of participation, um, as you would expect any, any good hospital to operate. Um, it is not without, when you're, when you're an organization as large as Acadia is, there is certainly going to be issues from time to time at a facility from, um, which requires redress. We have a very comprehensive, well-developed um, uh, corporate infrastructure that includes quality, safety, risk, high reliability, and we were able to deploy those to the field instantaneously in order to support facilities when an adverse event may occur within that facility. And as a consequence of that, we have every one of our facilities for 17 years has been and remains in good standing with all, uh, all regulatory bodies and oversight bodies for both mental health services, but also for hospitals generally. Okay. Thank you. Senator Rosen? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And as far as the, the relationship, just to piggyback on what Dr. Woods was saying, is Fairview has <clears throat> 10 hospitals, and it has uh, 40 primary care and specialty clinics, 30,000 30, employees. Um, I believe that as far as running a business, they know what they're doing, and uh, Acadia is, is coming into some partnerships with the leaders of healthcare delivery throughout the nation, and we um, did not um, release that information at this point until we get permission to do that. But this is a this is a stand-up um, partnership that I think will prove to the state very well. The question about St. Joe's and the def deficit, it. You know, whenever you're delivering mental health and medical, surgical, and emergency care in an aging facility, it, it, there is going to be problems. And so closing St. Joe's when they were at the about a 40-bed um, capacity during COVID and because of the labor so shortage was just a business decision they needed to make because they knew, Fairview knew, they could deliver mental health better than what they were doing. And with the um, the empath services that Fairview is offering right now. It's a rapid, comprehensive care in a calming environment. They un unveiled this back in March 29th of 2021. That will be part of the, the program um, at the, the new site, and it will be comprehensive to not only deal with the, their mental needs, but also their health primary care needs. 
So no one is going to be denied uh, care on any level when they enter that building. Um, and what else did we, what else would you like to? Oh yes, and Dr. Woods has something else that he would like to talk about. Dr. Woods. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, with respect to Ms. Sale's um, comments, I, 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 I failed to com respond in my last, uh, in my last comments. Um, she made reference to a 16 or $17 million settlement by Acadia Healthcare related to some fraud and abuse allegations. Uh, in point of fact, uh, in 2019, May of 2019, Acadia fully resolved a civil investigation involving technical and complex state and federal billing and coding procedures governing reimbursement for lab testing services. The settlement, which did not include any formal findings on the merits nor admissions of liability of Acadia, related to an alleged practices originating, originating years prior to Acadia's acquisition and operational control of a small number of practices originating um, uh, providing medica medication assisted treatment in West Virginia. Um, there were zero allegations or issues identified with the level of or quality of care provided to patients or the medical necessity for those services. So in acquiring that company, we acquired the liability and as dutiful um, citizens, we settled those liability issues with the federal government, but those again, was not issues that arose from or related to Acadia Healthcare. Thank you. Mr. Chair, one more thing. I, I, I knew Senator there was something Rosen. else. I do want to just close the loop on what's going to happen with St. Joe's. Number one, I addressed why it was closing. Number two, it's going to become the Fairview Community Health and Wellness Hub, which will develop and implement the solutions to support health equity through outpatient health care, FQHC with Minnesota Community Care. They'll become partners with Second Harvest for food security and uh, another partnership with Ebenezer for an adult senior day service. So that site will become an integral part of health care delivery in just a different manner. Um, and with that, I, I, let's open it up to questions if you're fine with that, Mr. Chair. I could say something. Thank you, Senator Rosen. Yes, we are. I was going to wait till you were completed there, but we do have questions uh, popping up. So, Senator Benson, you're first up. Thank you, Mr. Chair and, and Senator Rosen. We have been through a lot of moratorium exceptions. Um, why isn't Fairview using existing banked beds and just asking for a new license and moving their beds or using a, a facility that currently exists and doing this work so that you don't even have to come to the legislature. Senator Rosen, or do you, okay. Uh, Ms. Hines. Thank you, Chair, Chairman. We uh, at Fairview really feel that entering a, a partnership and a joint venture with Acadia and building a brand new hospital from the ground up that is specifically for inpatient mental health is the absolute best solution uh, for adding additional beds within our system. Senator Benson. Um, Mr. Chair, but why not use banked beds? You have, I think, nearly 1,000 in the Fairview system. I might have that number wrong, but it's more than you're asking for here, so why not? use the banked beds because every healthcare system that has zero beds has to actually come here and petition, but you have an asset that other systems don't have. So um, and Mr. Missell has a, a lifeline, I think. Miss Hines, are you, you want to call yeah. a friend? <laughs> he knows the detail better than I do. Chair, members. Well, welcome, Mr. Mussel. Nate Mazel, Lockridge Criminal Allen, representing Fairview Health Services. Senator Benson, to your question, um, the moratorium requires us to go through this process for an exception because it's a new license and because we cannot transfer those beds from existing Fairview facilities to the new joint venture. That is why we're going through this process. Senator Benson. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to, it, it, we've been through a lot of moratorium exceptions and when somebody has an asset as valuable <laughs> as banked beds, I think it should be part of the conversation here at the Capitol um, because there is a, an imbalance. It, you know, if, if um, another hospital system wanted to build mental health beds, they would have no options. Mm -hmm. And so 
just want that on the table as part of this conversation. If we decide to remove the hospital bed moratorium, as was discussed earlier, then all of this goes away and it becomes just about hospital licensing. Thank you. Uh, Senator Eaton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my, my concerns are also around the um, billing aspect. I spent my entire nursing career working in uh, mental health and um, the first 17 years I worked at St. Peter Regional Treatment Center and then I transferred to Anoka Regional Treatment Center where I worked until I went out into community mental health in 97. So my understanding is uh, if you have more than 16 beds you can't bill under MA and you can get a waiver so that you can only use state dollars but that's really pretty expensive for the state because you lose that what is it, about 57% now that we get from the feds. Um, so is this going to be a, a private pay, a, a Hazleton for mental health? Ms. Hines or Dr. Woods? I can start. Oh, Ms. Hines? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, committee member. We, in agreement in our partnership with Acadia, have complete agreement around serving anyone who presents and needs care. And we, in our new hospital, our, our a joint venture hospital, will be following all of our charity care policies that we have in place for the Fairview nonprofit system. And could I have Jeffrey also add to that? Dr. Woods. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Senator Eaton, thank you for your service as a psychiatric nurse. Um, I appreciate that being one myself. And so. Um, in addition to our agreement with Fairview, as it is with all of our joint venture partners, that we will follow their charity care policies, it is our practice as a company and it's our obligation as a company to ensure that we do not inquire about insurance prior to making the clinical decision about what the level of care need is for the patient um, and ensuring that those patients have access to that care regardless of their ability to pay. Um, this hospital will act no differently. The patients will come to us from emergency departments in, for the most part, um, and we expect that those patients will come based on their clinical criteria, not on their financial qualifications. And we will follow the charity care, charity care policy, policies of Fairview Health uh, to ensure that any bad debt or charity is properly um, attributed uh, for, the, for the care of those individuals. I would, also, I would also mention I believe it's close to 80% of the Medicaid population in the state of Minnesota is covered under a managed care organization. Um, those patients would be eligible under the, under the managed care organization for payer contracting with, uh, with the hospital. Senator Rosen wants to yeah, weigh uh, in first. Okay. Yes, uh, thank you, Senator, uh, or Mr. Chair. I think uh, Matt Burkett, Burdick from DHS is available to answer that question, if that's possible. Okay. The IMD question. Mr. Burdick, are you able to weigh in on that question? And, and did you hear the question that uh, Senator Eaton posed? I believe I did, Mr. Chair. For the record, Matt Burdick with the Department of Human Services. I'll do my best to respond to the question. I think the question was sort of how do we handle Medicaid payment and state payments um, given that this facility would be an IMD. Is that correct? Senator Eaton, is that That's exactly correct. right? Okay. Yes, Mr. Burdick. Great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Eaton. In Minnesota, we actually passed categorical eligibility for people who are residing in an IMD um, so that they can continue to receive all the Medicaid services that they would otherwise receive. And we use um, all state dollars to pay for that when someone's on fee for service. In managed care, there is a federal regulation that allows us to continue to draw down federal matching funds for any month a person is there for 15 days or less. And that if there's a month where the person is there for 16 days or more, then the, the monthly capitation payment to the managed care plan would also be paid with all state funds. And so there's a, a small limitation for nursing facility care, but otherwise here in Minnesota, we, um, we make up the lack of federal funding with state dollars. To the IMD. Thank you, Mr. Riddick. Uh, Senator Eaton. Mr. Chair. Well, I'm glad that the patients would be taken care of, but my concern is that um, 
This is going to be very expensive for a medical assistance program. This is going to cost our state a lot. This is not financially prudent. Um, but the other point is, as I said, I have a lot of uh, institutional experience, and um, neither of the institutions I worked at would I recommend sending any of my family members to just because of how the structure in an institution functions. As um, Sue Aberholden and I have um, repeatedly uh, addressed, the issue really what we need is supported housing for people with mental health issues more than we need uh, places to uh, put them in beds in a hospital. Thank you. Uh, Senator Chair. Wicklund. Mr. Or, Chair. Oh, Senator Rosen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I think um, I do need to respond that I think you need it all, all the above, uh, Senator Eaton. Uh, this is about hospital beds that are completely focusing on that patient that has um, acute needs at that time. And there's, I believe, four different focuses in this um, hospital that would have that would be focused on mood disorders and acute care. And I can, I can, yes, you can, uh, can speak to that, but. Uh, we absolutely need a place to take these people to, to stabilize them and to get them to care so we can put them into supportive housing. Totally agree with that, um, that next step. But we have to address the first step. The first step is we can't put them in a situation where um, the care or the, there are no beds or the care is, um, is going to be competing with other medical and surgical um, situations. This is going to be completely focused on mental health needs, and I think we're uh, underestimating that gem that we could have in this state. Thank you. And uh, I think Dr. Woods wants to just respond to the four different segments of okay. the facility. Thank you. Dr. Woods. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and Senator Eaton, the hospital will have uh, both adult and geriatric service lines. The adult service lines will be divided into principally four categories. Mood disorder, which will encompass um, uh, major depressive disorders, anxiety disorders, which include things like PTSD, um, and bipolar disorder. The thought disorder units will focus primarily on more chronic persistent mental illness of a more serious nature, like schizophrenia or other forms of psychosis. Um, we will have co-occurring disorder unit for adults, which will be a co-occurring substance use disorder and a psychiatric condition, and then primary psychiatric or primary substance use disorder services, including detox services for individuals who require those services. The geriatric program will have two components, one for patients who are cognitively intact but are otherwise suffering from either a mood or a thought disorder or a substance use disorder. Um, and require inpatient level of care for the treatment and stabilization of those symptoms and can engage in appropriate and normal sort of activities of daily living and um, individual therapy and group therapies. And then we'll be treating a population of geriatrics who have mild to moderate neurocognitive decline with disturbance of mood and behavior or an underlying psychiatric condition such as schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, et cetera. Um, those patients being slightly more complex as we try to alleviate their symptoms so that they can function better back in their home environment, whether that is a nursing home, assisted living, or their primary residence with their family. Okay, thank you. Senator Wicklund. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I'd, um, I've been trying to form some possible questions. Um, uh, Senator Eaton covered, I guess, one of the, the areas that I was interested in finding out more about. But, you know, I, what I kind of come back to is that we're, um, I'm really struggling in this case with a large, such a large proposal, um, such a large facility that will um, require it to, to be considered something different than what we um, have in the state right now that I'm really feeling like we don't have enough information, excuse me, to make, um, to make a good decision, um, that the public interest review process, um, I feel like we haven't gotten far enough along in that to be able to benefit from the analysis that's done by the Department of Health on the information that um, Fairview and Acadia are providing. 
um, I was looking on the website and I found that um, beyond the proposal, um, the initial proposal, um, the MDH did go back to Fairview with some additional questions and then um, Acadia and Fairview did supply a response to those questions. Um, I just found that this morning, so I haven't been able to go through it very um, much in detail. But it does lead me to think that um, with answers provided, there also needs to be analysis of what do those answers mean to us um, as state policymakers. And so the question about the financing mechanism, um, yes, there is a mechanism for the state to finance um, the, the additional uh, amounts needed for Medicaid patients. Well, I guess my question would be then, what is that um, change in the balance of um, what we're receiving from the federal government? You know, how much impact is that going to have on, on our state? As Senator Eaton raised the concern about, you know, how, how much difference is this going to make to us? Um, other areas that I see information about the staffing um, and the types of um, uh, employees that they would have, and to Mr. Klute's point about um, maybe differences from a current staffing model at St. Joe's to what this new facility would have for a staffing model in terms of the proportion of um, caregivers that are, um, I think he called them mental health technicians. Um, if that's a much higher number, what, what change does that have on the type of care that's provided? And I, I don't know that we can get the answer to that right today. But um, comparing that um, would be helpful and getting that feedback would be helpful. Um, another concern was raised about a lack of a pharmacy and a radiology department. Um, I don't know if you want to respond to that today, but that would be another case where I'd see it beneficial if we could have the analysis of the Department of Health on you know, what, what impact should that have on our decision. Um, and then the, I guess this is the last point that came to mind um, in terms of the staffing. Um, there is a question in here about um, commitment to retaining staff and uh, what is the commitment to um, maintaining um, compensation at levels equivalent to what they would be earning at other Fairview hospitals or as they transition. Um, and there's an answer to that provided, and, I, um, and it says that Acadia intends the new hospital will offer employees a competitive compensation package and so on. Um, but I guess I'd just like more analysis about what what does that actually mean for employees who are Fairview employees now? And should they choose to um, be employees at this new facility? Is there going to be a change um, to them, to their existing compensation? Um, and and how, how much difference um, should we expect in that? So I, I have, you know, a number of questions. I just feel like um, we need more time to get some of the answers from um, not only from Fairview, but from the public interest review. Um, and I just wanted to raise that as a significant concern I have with this proposal. So thank you. Senator Rosen. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Senator Wicklin. I was trying to write down some of these questions that you had. I do think at some point we should turn back to um, Assistant Commissioner Burdick for the answers on the cost that Senator sure. Wicklin was talking about. And I know that the public interest review um, between Fairview and Acadia came in very quickly and they submitted a, a letter of intent in early November and the application for a public interest review at the end of this December. And their hope is to uh, be complete by the end of 2023. And goodness, we know that we need these beds. We need to have a delivery system for mental health, um, some other, we need to have more beds for our, our mental health crisis. Um, if there, I know Dr. Woods too has some comments on some of the other questions that uh, Senator Wicklin had. Okay, and I think you, you, Senator Rosen, you did wonder if uh, Mr. Burdick had a uh, comment on that. Uh, oh, Mr. Burdick, is there anything you want to comment mm -hmm. on or that you yeah. can help answer? 
thank you, Mr. Chair. We are um, anticipated this would be a question that might come up, so we are working with our report to the forecast area to crunch that information. We'll get back to the committee. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Woods. Actually, or uh, uh, Senator Chair, Benson, actually, did you want uh, to get in? Mr. Burdick, could you uh, answer a question for me if it's okay, Mr. Chair? If, if a patient who's on fee-for-service goes to day 16, do we automatically pay or does it automatically go to zero reimbursement? Do we automatically pay both the state and federal share? Mr. Burdick? Um, yep, thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Benson, for fee-for-service, it's actually regardless of length of stay, we pay with all state dollars. And then for folks on managed care, it's at that day 16 that we pay the monthly capitation to the health plan for that month uh, with all state funding. But that is, um, it's in our eligibility chapter of law. So essentially someone remains eligible for medical assistance, but with all state dollars when they're in one of those two circumstances, okay. if, if that makes sense. Senator Benson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Burdick. And so Senator Rosen, we might wanna look at it. it we're not gonna get a fiscal note, but because we already have in statute that if they go to day 16, it becomes all state share. I don't know how much that's already in our forecast, but I think it's something for us to consider um, as we look at this. And I know I've been told it's not material. I agree, not material, but we had this problem with CBHHs and, and kept coming back for money. And so I think we need to figure that out. Okay, uh, Dr. Woods. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and if it's all right, I'd like to address both uh, Senator Benton and Senator Wicklin's comments or questions. Sure, um, please do. With respect to length of stay and the impact with, on the state dollars, I wanted just to clarify for the committee that the average length of stay in our hospitals nationally tracks fairly closely to what the National Institutes for Health publish as the average lengths for both age categories and diagnostic categories with the mood disorder population typically being in the five to six, maybe seven day range, depending upon the severity of their symptoms. The um, thought disorder population typically in the, in the six to eight, maybe nine days, depending upon the severity of their illness. Um, the co-occurring patients are typically somewhat shorter, four to six days for detox, stabilization, and outpatient referrals. Um, and I should mention that this hospital will also have outpatient services, both uh, intensive outpatient and partial hospital pro services as an alternative to inpatient or as a step down to inpatient from inpatient. Um, and for our geriatric patients, which are mar largely going to be covered by Medicare or a managed Medicare product, um, we would expect that those patients are going to be in the eight to 11 day average length of stay range, again, depending upon the severity of their symptoms and, and what the physician and treatment team determine is the best course of care for them. So we think it's very unlikely that we're going to be triggering past 50 day length, 15 day length of stay that would potentially have a fiscal impact on the state on, on, on too frequent of a basis. Um, it would be very, very infrequent is my expectation as it is across our national um, platform. Um, and then, Senator Whitlin, with respect to your couple of your, your questions, um, I did want to clarify that the hospital will have a full pharmacy in the building. Um, and in fact, in addition to a full pharmacy and a pharmacist on site, um, that we also will have a program called Meds, Meds to Beds so that when a patient is being discharged, they're discharged with an adequate supply of their medications at the time that they leave the building to ensure that they have what they need to get to their next appointment or to their follow-up care um, so that nobody leaves with merely a prescription that may or may not get filled or leave without adequate medication support to continue their care in, in the outpatient setting. Um, we do have access to radiology services um, through contracts with uh, third parties for minor uh, uh, radio, radiographic examinations or that we, that we may want to perform. Um, and then with our partner system, if we have a more significant radiological concern or diagnostic test, then we would, we would, we would lean to our partners um, at the Fairview Health System regions and others to assist with those more significant radiological concerns if and when those should come up. And I will tell you that those are relatively infrequent in a psychiatric hospital but they do come up from time to time if the patient has a significant change in condition. 
Um, with respect to laboratory, we do contract laboratory services, and um, we have not made that decision yet how that will occur. It's too early in the process, but it may very well be that it would be a purchase service back from our partner at Fairview. Um, we are able to draw labs and, and have stat labs managed in timely, just as any other hospital can. Um, and we also furnish our hospitals with a device called an iStat machine, which allows for nurses to do a point of care immediate laboratory test for all of the standard labs you would expect to see, whether it's a CBC, BMP. Um, we can even go as far as doing cardiac enzymes and troponin levels if we needed to. Um, and we can do that as point of care and have results almost instantly, literally within a couple of minutes. If those results are abnormal, such that the patient requires a higher level of care, we can make that arrangement for the patient. If they are within normal limits or reasonably normal limits, we would do a confirmatory lab just to uh, validate the results of the iStat. Um, and the iStat, if you're not familiar, is a, is a commonly used device in emergency departments and other healthcare settings where laboratory quick confirmatory laboratory results are important and necessary to the health and well-being of the patients. Okay. Thank you. And uh, members, just a heads up as we all look at the clock, we're nearing the end of our time. So I've got uh, a number of people on the list yet. Senator Eaton wanted to, did you have a question you wanted to get in quickly here? And then we'll, we'll hope that the questions and the answers are shortened up a little bit so that we can get, I've got Senator Abler's Nelson and Dreheim yet. So okay, I'll be quick. Go. I just had a question for um, with DHS being on the hook for 100% after a certain point. Um, I guess I, I question your optimism on how many people will be out by that time. My experience in the um, treatment centers here in Minnesota, and if you'll ask the counties, because they have to pay after that point in this state, um, it happens more often than you think. And um, I was wondering, um, uh, Senator Rosen, if you have a fiscal note on what the cost of that would be. Senator Rosen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No, I, I do not have that. And I think that's a, probably a question for Assistant Commissioner Burdick. Mr. Burdick, um, question on uh, fiscal note or the payments again? Uh, certainly, Mr. Chair, Senator Eaton, um, for these facilities, the county share that we have with the state operating programs would not be in place, and so this would just be a state general fund impact. I don't believe we've um, completed a fiscal note for this bill, and I would defer to my colleague, our budget director, Elise Bailey, on the fiscal side of that. Okay, thank you. And I, so I think we'll, we'll have to do a follow-up on that. Um, uh, so let's go to uh, Senator Abler. Well, thanks. And just a comment about the fiscal note. I'm, I'm surprised, if you like it or don't like this program, that it wouldn't cost anything. When we tried to have PCAs drive people who were, they were with to Walmart to buy socks, they charged us multiple millions of dollars because they couldn't fulfill the PCA hours. The people couldn't fill up their, their group of PCA hours. These people wouldn't be going anywhere. And so then now they're going to go somewhere. And so it just seems that I, I just, it's amazing what's free and what's not, Senator Rosen. That's all I can say. Um, and I guess I'll just make a comment. I had a nice chat with uh, Dr. Woods and, and uh, is it Mr. or Dr. Hines um, earlier, and that was, I think, productive. Um, I think that I just wanted to kind of, we, we talked about uh, the previous children's, uh, or talked about uh, closing St. Joe's. It was just a business decision just a business decision. And so Fairview is nonprofit and they make this business decisions, but it seems to me that the, there's no profit in mind. They just want to, can we survive with this or not? Um, you know, with all respect, Acadia was either the founder or one of the early people was a venture capitalist. That's a whole different approach to healthcare. Healthcare has become more and more about venture capital and, 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 and profits and losses. And, and so I read all this and I'm, you know, like, whoa, it's, it's great. We're gonna, nobody's going to be turned away. It's going to be free. But then at some point, business decisions are going to come along, and I don't think Acadia is in this for, for nonprofit reasons. And I, you know, and I, I just don't know when the profit motives, when the charity kindness of Fairview morphs into, we're losing too much money, we have to change our, our model. And, and I don't know how we fix that. 
And so just, Mr. And I, I wish there could be a nonprofit partner, personally. And I'll just say, if I were voting today, I would vote no. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Abler. Uh, Senator Nelson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, we're in a mental health crisis. We, ha we are at a crisis stage. And we know I I've experienced constituents who have not been able to get the help they need when they need it. And it's difficult for the patient, it's difficult for the, for the family. It delays treatment, it delays diagnosis, and it just compounds the stress. And so I'm a bit surprised that there is, well, I will say there's one thing I'm concerned about, which is uh, day 16 and on and how that might impact the, our state budget. That is something that we will address, we will look at, and we will get that information. But I appreciate the, I, I appreciate the fact that there are going to be 144, I believe, more mental health beds to serve Minnesotans. I think that is a good thing. And one thing that I think might have gotten lost in the discussion um, when there was this, I, I thought I might have understood some uh, comments to indicate, well, why can't we have these uh, mental health beds at St. Joe's? And um, I've not been to St. Joe's. I don't know St. Joe's. But I understand it's an older uh, facility. Uh, I understand 50, 40-year-old hospitals were built very differently than what we know today about how architecture, space, light impacts mental health. And I think it's incumbent upon us that we allow these type of innovations. We know so much more about the wonderful human brain and how it works now than we did 40 or 50 years ago. It's really time that we allow these type of innovations in our mental health, uh, in, in the mental health arena. And there's great concern that all too often our mental health services are really locked into the model of 40 years ago. And we, we need to address that. I think this pr proposal does that. I will look forward to seeing what type of fiscal impact there might be on the state because of the, uh, the number of beds and the type of beds that could lead to additional state costs. But the fact of the matter is, these are Minnesotans who need the care. And so uh, while we need to be aware of the state, uh, state cost, uh, I think that's important. I I'm going to put on one hat quickly, which is my uh, Capital Area Architectural Planning Board hat. Uh, one of the things that, and I know this will come through the cap board, just to get it on the record, make sure maybe we can get the question answered and then just move on. Uh, one of the concerns about any time we have anything, any building uh, around the Capitol in the 66 block radius around the Capitol has to do with parking. And of course, there's a parking ramp which has been uh, leased out to use by uh, capital uh, visitors or capital staff. And so I just would like you to briefly address uh, the parking. Uh, the, it's, that's not the main issue. Main issue is taking care of Minnesotans and mental health crisis. But I do want you to just address that, that parking piece, please. Dr. Woods? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and Senator Nelson, thank you for your comments. Um, the uh, parking ramp that you were referring to uh, will remain, and it will continue to be available um, as it has always been available for capital staff and for other visitors in the community. Um, and we'll make some aesthetic improvements to it, um, but otherwise it will remain. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Senator Draham. Thank you, Chair Aki and, and Senator Rosen for, for allowing this discussion today. But I, I think we have to kind of look back a little bit, members. Um, I've only been here six years, and we, we've done a lot of attempts to change mental health, um, and we've done some good things. The telemental health that Senator Rosen worked on, uh, Senjim's projects in Olmsted County and elsewhere across the state, but we haven't done enough, and I think we all can agree to that. I've heard discussion about business models and um, why don't you have this included and how are you going to be profitable but then I hear complaints that you're a for-profit company. Members, 
we need more players in the state to be serious about mental health. And I, I'm grateful that you guys are bringing this proposal to us. Um, we need help. As far as the fiscal concerns, I have concerns too. I, I think we have to look at it. But who are we kidding? We are going to pay for it one way or another. Either it's going to be the homeless shelters and the drug treatment programs, um, or it's going to be something like this that's a little more proactive and get people the help sooner rather than later. So uh, I, I encourage a fiscal dive. I always do. But we're going to have to pay as a society one way or another. We already are. Um, <coughs> do we need to understand it? Of course we do. Do we need to maybe modify some things? Maybe we do. But um, I, I just encourage, I know it's not. we're not going to vote on it today. It's going to be laid over from my understanding. But um, I, I think we have to start thinking a little differently on, on how we're going to handle this. And um, just, I think, I think we need to be more positive and uh, encourage more ingenuity on different types of systems for mental health. And I think this is a wonderful example. So thank you. Thank you. Back, uh, Senator Rosen, if you want to wrap this up for today, that'd be Thank you, Mr. Wonderful. Chair. Uh, thank you very much for the hearing. I know we are laying this over. Um, I do want to thank Fairview for making this commitment. They did reach out to other partners in the state, and, and no one wanted to look at a new delivery model such as this. Um, and Acadia, who has 230 mental health facilities in the nation, stepped up to the plate. And again, the management of the new hospital, Acadia will comply with Fairview's financial assistant policy, and they, there will be no distinctions or qualifications for admission relative to patients on Medicaid or Medicare. Um, the the um, physical and mental needs will be addressed at this facility. And I really want to thank them for thinking out of the box. We have to do something different. We are in a crisis. We can nitpick as much as we want, but we have people who cannot find beds, and they are traveling everywhere to get help. So somewhere along the line, we thought it, we, we stopped thinking about the patient, the person who was in a crisis. And that's what I want you to think about, members. Is it perfect? No. We can, we can nitpick as much as we want on, on the little things, but I'm a little surprised at some of the testimony, too, against this, because I had not heard of this. No one has come to me on these issues. Uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Ms. Abderholden and I try to uh, talk back and forth, and I've worked with her for years on mental health issues. But I feel very strongly about this, because there is a concerted effort to, to, to bring mental health care in a different delivery modem, modality. So members, keep an open mind, but, but when you walk away, please think about the patient because they, Fairview is doing everything right. They are trying different. It's about that patient in this facility. So with that, thank you again, Mr. Chair and members for this opportunity, and I look forward to coming back. Sounds good. Thank you, Senator Rosen, and thank you to all the testifiers that joined us today. It is much appreciated. And with that, members, this bill will be laid over, and we are adjourned. Thank you, Senator.